Hello, my name is Wayne Lusardi. I am the state of Michigan's maritime archaeologist with the Department of Natural Resources. And I'm stationed in Alpena at Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. I've been here for just shy of 20 years. And my primary research focus over those last two decades has been cultural resources in the Great Lakes around Michigan. And of course, the most iconic of these cultural resources in the waters of the Great Lakes are shipwrecks. And there are lots of them, some 10,000 plus shipwrecks across the Great Lakes system. About 1,500 of those are right here in Michigan. About seven years ago, I was made aware of an airplane, a historic airplane crash site in Lower Lake Huron, and I became very fascinated with our aircraft heritage, just like our maritime heritage. And so I wanted to start studying airplane accidents and the potential for archaeological aviation sites in the Great Lakes. And over the last seven years, I accumulated a lot of research on that topic, and I found that there are some 1,100 planes or aircraft of all variety that have crashed in the Great Lakes. Almost a third of those happened in Lake Michigan alone, about 450 or so aviation accidents in Lake Michigan. And most of the reason for so many airplane and aviation aircraft accidents in Lake Michigan is because of Chicago and Milwaukee and Racine and Gary and all of the towns that support airfields on the west shore of the state of Michigan. And so when you at whatever you get a lot of aviation activity in an area, there are bound to be accidents. And unfortunately, they happen over the water and many of them are fatal. There were some 1,100 or so fatalities in these airplane accidents in Lake Michigan. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about some of the 450 or so, and I'm only gonna kinda of look at a few of those examples of some of the airplane and aviation accidents that occurred in Lake Michigan beginning in the late 19th century. So I think every good story should start with the circus. They're in, the United States, right after the American Civil War, the Americans were starved for entertainment. Everybody wanted to kind of just be happy and, and get a smile back on your face. And people like P.T. Barnum and Ringling Brothers really facilitated this, and they created circus troops that would go around the United States and entertain the masses in big cities and in small towns. And a lot of these circus troops would bring things in that wowed crowds. If you wanna sell tickets, you gotta wow crowds. And one of the best ways of wowing crowds is showing them something that they've not seen before. Things like exotic animals from Africa, uh, do dastardly deeds like shooting people from cannons or trapeze acts, that kind of stuff. And one of the things that wowed Americans and people across the world in the later 19th century was aerial ascents. And there was a whole, uh, discipline kind of formed around getting, building balloons and then ascending in these balloons. And sometimes this was just for sheer recreational purposes. Other times it was for scientific and military purposes. But P.T. Barnum knew this. He knew that tickets would be sold if you ascended into the heavens with a person, sometimes with an animal even, and uh, this wowed crowds and sold tickets. One of these circus acts was happening in Chicago in July, 1875, and the pilot of the balloon was a Mr. Washington Donaldson. Donaldson was known as an aeronaut, and the people that were employed to ascend in balloons were called aeronauts, sometimes balloonatics, as the, the media like to kind of uh, give their nickname. He was making an ascension over Chicago in 1875. He had on board with him Newton Grimwood, who was a local reporter with Chicago newspapers. And they were just to go up in this balloon over the circus uh, grounds in downtown Chicago. And they were still tethered to the ground. But what happened is their ground crew lost control of the tether and prevailing winds from the West pushed the balloon out. The balloon's namesake was P.T. Barnum. It went out over Lake Michigan and ultimately crashed into the lake in July 1875. Washington Donaldson and Newton Grimwood were never seen alive again. And so far as I know, this was the first fatal aviation accident over the Great Lakes and over Lake Michigan. Mr. Grimwood's body eventually came ashore at what is now Sleeping Bear Dunes State Park. Not long afterwards, a, another air, 
aircraft or another balloon, this one, a hydrogen filled balloon, uh, ascended from St. Louis. St. Louis was a big aviation center for the United States. And a lot of balloon ascensions occurred from there, both military and private and civilian aircraft were ascending from St. Louis. The prevailing winds from the west and southwest would generally push these balloons eastward, bringing them to places like Philadelphia, New York, and Washington, D.C. But in this case, in September of 1879, a professor, John Wise, and his passenger, George Burr, ascended from St. Louis on a balloon called Pathfinder. They were destined to go to the East Coast again uh, to see how long you can stay aloft, to see how high you can go, to see how fast you can move a balloon and how much payload it can carry. Instead, the balloon was pushed northward. It ended up uh, crossing over Lower Lake Michigan right off of Gary, Indiana, and it went out over the lake and crashed into Lake Michigan in 1879. And similarly, just like the PT Barnum before, John Wise and George Burr were never seen again alive. What would follow is over a thousand aviation accidents around the Great Lakes. And again, you can see their distribution is largely dependent on accompanying air or local airfields and aviation resources. And if you look in the lower basin of Lake Michigan, you see a huge amount of aircraft accidents that occurred there. The code in this illustration, the black uh, icons represent commercial or civilian aircraft that crashed all over the lakes. The green are Army or Air Force aviation accidents that occurred in the waters of the Great Lakes. The red represent foreign military aircraft, particularly Canadian RAF. Around Toronto, you'll see a lot of Norwegians and then some free French that were training here in the Great Lakes during the Second World War. And then the blue represent aircraft that were operated by the United States Navy. And you can see a huge number of blue craft in the lower basin of Lake Michigan. The dots represent almost 1,100 aviation accidents. And these are all projected locations. These are not actual wreck sites or anything like that. This is just based on my research where these accidents happen. Many of the aircraft of all variety were recovered, especially those that crashed near shore places like off of Chicago, off of Cleveland, et cetera. When the aircraft goes into the lake, it very often is recovered. One of the first fixed wing aircraft accidents to occur in Lake Michigan occurred on August 15, 1911, when the Massant monoplane is a single wing aircraft with an open cockpit. So it would look like a biplane, but only with a single wing. And it was operated by a pilot by the name of St. Croix Johnstone. He was a pretty famous aviator for the time. I think all aviators were famous at that time because there were only handfuls of them around the world. And Chicago was hosting an international air race and uh, pilot Johnstone ended up flying this monoplane out over Lake Michigan. It nosedived into the lake on a tight turn and he was killed in that accident. Most of that aircraft was recovered uh, after the accident as was Mr. Johnstone's body. One of the great mysteries, mysterious disappearances of a biplane occurred in 1925. Three men, all Chicago Flyers, all experienced pilots, departed in a Curtis Standard J uh, by the name of the Maiden Gertrude. Most of the airplanes at the time in their golden age of aviation were named just like ships. They were referred to as ships, not aircraft. And um, so the Maiden Gertrude went aloft at Chicago in July 1925 and went out over uh, Lake Michigan in uh, transit to Detroit, Michigan. It ended up disappearing in fog and bad weather. And the three men, Mr. Banker, Cutterell, and Gathercall, were not seen, seen again. And the aircraft is still missing to this day. An unusual aircraft that went down in Lake Michigan was an airplane known as an auto gyro. This was an open cockpit monoplane, but in addition to having a propeller mounted at the forward end of the fuselage, it also had a rotary 
blade, just like a helicopter would. And it used this in a combination of um, forward momentum and kind of short end landings. And this was sort of an experimented um, short takeoff and landing kind of aircraft. This particular one, was flying from South Bend, Indiana, and it was heading to Glenview, Illinois, just outside of Chicago on September 8th, 1933. It had three people on board. The pilot was Charles Otto, again, an experienced pilot. He had with him a mechanic by the name of Spud Manning and a woman, Magenta Gerard. The three of them departed South Bend were heading out over the lake uh, just off the Indiana shoreline and the auto gyro Avro 620 ended up in Lake Michigan. And of course the three were, were not seen alive again. The aviation activity around the Great Lakes and in per Lake Michigan in particular really took off literally during the Second World War. The states around the Great Lakes had a lot to offer that the war effort. Michigan and other states had millions of young men and women that directly enlisted in the armed services, and they had millions more that would contribute to the production of that war machine. A lot of automobile factories in Michigan, for example, were converted to build tanks and Jeeps and aircraft and places like Willow Run uh, outside of Detroit can produce a lot of aircraft in a month, way more than you can actually, in a quicker time, than the military could actually train pilots to fly those aircraft. And so the Navy and the Army were both at this sort of uh, kind of behind the eight ball, trying to get pilots spun up, trying to get as many men and women pilots train so that they can go overseas and participate in the war effort. What Michigan and the Great Lakes didn't have was the threat of German and Japanese submarine attacks. And when you're looking at Navy pilots pre-World War II, most of them were doing their training out of Pensacola and Norfolk and Long Beach, California, that sort of, those places. Those places were not accessible now because they were always being threatened by imminent attack. And a good amount of the Battle of the Atlantic happened right off the East Coast from Maine all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. And so it was not a good place to train naval aviators how to take off and land on aircraft carriers. So the United States Navy came up with kind of a plan uh, utilizing the Great Lakes and existing vessels in the Great Lakes to train naval aviators. So they acquired two palace steamers. These were both uh, side wheel steamers that were just shy of 500 feet in length. They were built in the teens and they were basically cruise ships that went around the Great Lakes from Detroit and Cleveland and Chicago and other places. One of these was the CNB that was built in 1913 at Detroit. And then the other was the Greater Buffalo that was built a few years later in 1924 in Lorain, Ohio, um, outside of uh, Cleveland. So both of these beautiful palace steamers were tricked out for passenger accommodations. They can carry up to a thousand passengers or so. Um, this, the staterooms were just enormous and, and quite elegant. And this is sort of the Titanics of the Great Lakes, if you will. And during the war effort, the United States Navy acquired both of these vessels. And in about three months, they sheared off all of those luxury accommodations. They took out all of those staterooms. They took out all of the superstructure and they converted them into flat top aircraft carriers. The CNB became the USS Wolverine in 1942. And the Greater Buffalo became the USS Sable in 1943. Both of these aircraft carriers were then stationed in Chicago at Navy Pier that you can see here in this aerial image. And between 1942 and 1945, over 136,000 landings occurred on these two aircraft carriers, most of that occurring in Lower Lake Michigan. And over 17, almost 18,000 US Naval aviators were qualified to take off and land from aircraft carriers during this uh, roughly four year time span, including George H.W. Bush, who would later become president of the United States. Now, despite all of these very successful 136,000 plus landings, um, a lot of times they 
landings didn't weren't successful. And you got to remember that this is the very first time that these pilots are landing and taking off from a moving vessel. And sometimes accidents occurred. And the other contributing factor to the accidents were the, sheer, the just the comparative size of these aircraft. The Great Lakes boats were much smaller and they were much shorter in length. And so they didn't have overnight accommodations. They didn't have hangar decks. They didn't need all of the crew members that you would see on a contemporary aircraft carrier that was involved in action in the Pacific or in the Atlantic. So they were much closer to the water and the the runway on the air on the flat top deck was much shorter than a contemporary aircraft carrier. That coupled with the inexperience of the pilots and there are bound to be accidents. And over the course of the war, a lot of the accidents occurred right on the deck, either in takeoff or landings. And most of the time the aircraft was only minimally damaged and could be put back into service. And other times bad things happen. And over the course of the war, about 140 or so Navy aircraft ended up in Lake Michigan. And they represent a whole variety of aircraft, mostly Hellcats and Wildcats. But a lot of the airplanes that were used by the Navy and by the military in general were quickly made obsolete throughout the war. And if you can imagine, right before the attack on Pearl Harbor, a lot of the airplanes that were on US Naval aircraft carriers were wooden biplanes. And within five years, we had jet aircraft and nuclear weapons. And so the technology changed through that time period was incredible, incredibly fast. And consequently, a lot of the earlier aircraft that were utilized in places like the Battle of Midway were then retired out and they were either scrapped and converted into new aircraft altogether, utilizing their parts in a recycling capacity, or they were put into training exercises. And a lot of those ended up at Glenview uh, in these carrier qualification exercises over Lake Michigan. So consequently, some of these aircraft are quite unique, even though there were maybe 10 thousand plus of them made, now suddenly there's hardly any of them at all because they've all been scrapped or they've been lost in action. But a few of them ended up on the bottom of the lake and were very well preserved in the freshwater of Lake Michigan. And so here they are giving us a great opportunity to study fairly unique aircraft. In the 1960s and 1970s, scuba diving became very popular in the Great Lakes. And consequently, people started finding shipwrecks and they started finding aircraft wrecks outside of Chicago. And you can kind of see a breakdown of some of the types of aircraft that were lost in these training accidents, you know, Wildcats and Hellcats and Corsairs and Avengers and those sorts of things. And a lot of times, some of these materials were recovered and other times entire aircraft were rec recovered. This is a Grumman FM2 Wildcat, bureau number 57039. And this ended up uh, crashing off of one of the carriers in during the war. And it was just recovered about 10 years ago or so. And you can see uh, the aircraft is only minimally damaged. Uh, Propellers are slightly bent where it hit the water, but because they were taking off and landing on aircraft carriers in such a slow kind of rate of speed, um, very often they are coming out to be fairly intact aircraft and not broken up because of a high speed impact with the lake. You can also see covered all over this aircraft are quagga and zebra mussels. These are invasive mussels that came from uh, Northern Europe and in bilge water and they have spread out all over the Great Lakes. And when these airplanes were first found back in the 1960s and 70s, they were completely devoid of muscles. And consequently, they were in a much better condition than they are today. And some of the airplanes that were recovered early on pre-invasive muscles were actually put into a condition where they're flying again. And now that the muscles are here, they're creating so much deterioration on the aluminum skin, particularly, um, that the likelihood of getting any of these aircraft flying again is pretty, pretty minimal.
So this is a Grumman Wildcat that was pulled out of the lake a decade ago. And it is actually at the Air Zoo in Kalamazoo where it's undergoing restoration and ultimately it will be exhibited. But this is in one of the outlier buildings at the K Zoo. And you can see this as part of the exhibit and it's largely being conserved and restored by a group of volunteer aviation enthusiasts. Another Wildcat, this one, an F4F, is, was recovered. It's in incredible condition after restoration. And this is now hanging in O'Hare International Airport in Chicago. And I visited a few years ago. And over the course of the last several decades, about four dozen or so of the 140 or so airplanes lost during the war in Lake Michigan have been recovered. Most of them have been restored and a lot of them are exhibited throughout the United States at various airports and aviation museums. The lion's share of them are in Pensacola at the US Naval Aviation Museum there. And the airplanes that, are, that were utilized by the United States Navy still remain property of the United States Navy in perpetuity. And the Navy is working with private contractors to do the recovery and the restoration efforts of these aircraft. A single Voight Corsair was also recovered and is in the process of being restored for a museum exhibit. This one back in up again about 10 years ago. Dive bombers were also represented in the aviation collection and a lot, quite a lot of uh, Dauntlesses and Avengers ended up crashing off of the carriers either in takeoff or landings. And many dozens of them have been recovered over the years. This particular one is a Douglas SBD-3 Dauntless. And it is exhibited also at the Kalamazoo Air Zoo. Naval aircraft weren't the only, or airplanes weren't the only aircraft being utilized on the carriers of Lake Michigan. There, exper there was a lot of experimentation with drone aircraft at the time. And this is an image of the USS Sable. It's in Traverse Bay off of Traverse City. And they were actually flying full size. These are 30 foot or so uh, drone aircraft that are remote controlled that are flying off of the aircraft, Sable in this case, and they are, they are sometimes loaded with explosives, other times they have guns on board, and they're, being, they're attempting to use them as sort of flying bombs and using the Waukesha Shoals Lighthouse as a target. And a few of these drones were lost in Lake Michigan during the war. Of course, at the conclusion of World War II, the military didn't just stop training and a lot of bases were still operated around the lakes and there were still drone aircraft that were utilized in uh, throughout military bases along the lake shores of the Great Lakes. These are anti-aircraft target drones. You can see originally a pilot would pull a target and then anti-aircraft gunners would train by shooting that target, whether it was a uh, some kind of a fixed wing kind of target, or if it was just a cloth banner. And you can see the imminent threat to that pilot that is pulling the target. And so they ended up building drones. Again, these are from the 1940s and 1950s that would fly along the lakeshore, in this case, off of Camp Claybanks uh, between uh, Frankfurt and Ludington area of on the shore of Lake Michigan. They would fly up and down the coast and anti-aircraft gunners would attempt to shoot these down. And on occasion, you'll see some of these 13 foot long drones that get washed up on the beaches of Lake Michigan around Camp Claybanks and some other places like Camp Perry and Lake Erie and other places where they utilize this kind of anti-aircraft gun practice. The Cold War, was very active, of course, and there were many bases throughout the United States and across the world. And a lot of these bases were right here in Michigan and Wisconsin and Illinois and other places around the Great Lakes. And very often aircraft that were flying out of Chicago and Milwaukee and Racine 
and Minneapolis and over here in Grayling and Detroit and Oscoda would utilize the Great Lakes as a trading place. And if you look at charts of the Great Lakes, and if you look at the chart of Lake Michigan here, there are, in all five of the lakes, there are these big purple rectangular boxes. And those represent areas that the military uses for live fire gunnery practice, for bomb dropping, that sort of thing. And so it was considerably more widespread in the early years of the Cold War. Those boxes have been since you know, kind of reduced in size. Um, but there is a lot of activity, even now, across the Great Lakes, utilizing the lakes for gunnery practice and bombardment practice. The North American F-86 Sabre was one of the most common aircraft that was utilized in bases around the Great Lakes in the 1950s, about the time of the Korean War and into the late 1950s. And at least seven of these aircraft crashed into Lake Michigan, two off of Sheboygan in October 1956 uh, that ran into one another. Uh, and they're, both of the wrecks ended up in the water. A Lockheed T-33 is a training aircraft known as a shooting star. This particular aircraft left Philadelphia. It was heading to Chicago in December 1953. It had two men on board, Major Harold Herrick and his radar operator, Lieutenant Edward Bernard. They went out over the lake somewhere off of the shoreline of Indiana, and the aircraft never came home. Some of the wreckage, a parachute and a jacket were recovered out of the lake, uh, but Major Herrick and Lieutenant Bernard were not found. Another aircraft used by the United States Air Force pretty extensively throughout the 1950s was known as an F-89 Scorpion. These were built by Northrop. They were very fast aircraft, uh, fighter aircraft. The F in front of an aircraft designation uh, refers to a fighter. Uh, in the early days of World War II, it was a P or pursuit aircraft, was, which was basically a fighter. The B stands for bomber, bomber aircraft. The F-89 Scorpion, this one was piloted by a Colonel Seymour Levinson and his radar operator was Lieutenant Robert Gaum. They were coming in in fog conditions at Billy Mitchell Field off of Milwaukee. And as they were approaching the field from over Lake Michigan, it was so foggy that they had no sense of exactly where they were and what altitude they were flying at. They ended up coming in right over the harbor and docked at one of the docks in Milwaukee Harbor was a big steel barge, the Maya, that was built in 1898. It was a, almost a 400 foot long barge that was there. And the Scorpion flown by Lieutenant Levinson flew right into the barge. And you can see that big gaping hole right underneath the pilot house of the barge. The aircraft was obliterated and the two men on board were killed. The United States Navy similarly flew jets over the lakes and continue to do so. They have stations at Glenview and uh, outside of Chicago and at uh, Gros Isle next to Detroit. And these naval air stations operated for quite a long time over the Great Lakes. And a lot of jet aircraft like this F-9F Cougar were utilized for practice over the lakes. This one was coming up from New Orleans. It was heading to Glenview outside of Chicago in 1958. There was Lieutenant Commander Clarence Pickert at the control of the vessel. It went out over the lake and again went down into the water uh, for unknown reasons. And Lieutenant Commander Pickert was killed in that accident. The largest aircraft to go down in the Great Lakes and in Lake Michigan was a B-52 built by Boeing. These are straddle fortresses used throughout the Vietnam War. This one was based at Westover in Massachusetts, and it was flying here to Michigan to do a simulated nuclear strike on the Bayshore facility between Petoskey and uh, Charlevoix. 
The aircraft had nine men on board. It flew out over the lake, over Little Traverse Bay. It was about 900 feet above the, the lake surface when something happened. This was in January 1971. The aircraft exploded and went about 900 feet up and all nine men were killed. This is the crash site from the Alpina News. Immediately after the crash, the United States Navy sent divers. It was, the lake was partially iced over and they spent a couple of days doing dive operations in about 240 feet of water in Little Traverse Bay. They recovered some things and then went away. And the problem with that was there was immediately rumors that the airplane may have been carrying live nukes and that the Navy was there very specifically to recover those nuclear bombs. So it wasn't just a North, Northwest Michigan rumor. It had enough credibility that it ended up uh, having a congressional committee formed to investigate the Air Force to see if they were in fact carrying live nukes at the time. The Air Force, of course, denied that they had such weapons on board. Ultimately, the conclusion was that the Air Force is probably telling the truth, but we'll never know. About six months after this accident occurred in January 1971, the military uh, hired a private contractor to go and recover as much of the aircraft as possible. And a lot of pieces and parts of the B-52 were recovered from the bottom in a, in a couple of hundred feet of water. <clears throat> Of course, military aircraft are not the only airplanes to have been lost in the Great Lakes. Um, the worst aircraft accident in the United States up to that time occurred when a Douglas DC-4 departed LaGuardia International Airport in New York. It was heading to Minneapolis and then the West Coast. It had on board 58 people, three crew members and uh, 55 passengers and it departed from LaGuardia on June 23rd, 1950. This was right literally the day before the United States would get involved in the Korean conflict. It approached the lake shore of Lake Michigan off Benton Harbor area, it went out over the lake, something happened to the aircraft that either exploded in flight, nobody really knows exactly what happened, but the result was the airplane was lost in lower Lake Michigan off Benton Harbor or Holland area and the 58 people on board were all killed. Quite a lot of wreckage was found from that, a lot of floatsum pieces and parts of the aircraft, blankets and pieces of seats, things like that, and human remains were found floating uh, all throughout Lake Michigan and along the beaches from Indiana all the way up to about uh, Muskegon area but the primary wreckage of the aircraft has not yet been found. There has been a great amount of effort to locate this aircraft. Uh, Valerie Van Heest, working out of the Michigan Maritime Museum out of South Haven, has been uh, very aggressively searching for this aircraft. She has found a lot of shipwrecks in that process. And just uh, about a year ago, uh, she was able to work with Expedition Unknown and Josh came here uh, to help her in that search. They did a lot of remote sensing work and a lot of diving of targets, but still have not yet found the airplane. The project, however, has resulted in quite a lot of product. One of them was a, a wonderful exhibit on the people that were involved in this tragedy that occurred uh, 70 years ago. Um, this exhibit occurred at the Michigan Maritime Museum in South Haven. Not long after the loss of the Northwest flight, a United Flight 389, a Boeing 727, departed from LaGuardia, the same airport in New York City. This time, this one, this aircraft was headed to Chicago in August 1965. It was on its final approach to Chicago on a pretty clear and calm day, and something happened. The aircraft exploded, ended up in the lake, and the 30 people on board the United flight were similarly killed. 
Unlike the Northwest flight, however, a good amount of wreckage was found and recovered and investigated. And mo in fact, most of the wreckage was uh, recovered from the lake bottom off Lake Forest and brought into Chicago for investigation. A lot of privately owned aircraft have gone down, probably close to 200 or so have crashed in Lake Michigan and another couple of hundred around the Great Lakes. Uh, most of them were small uh, private aircraft like Cessna 172s and that sort of thing. This particular Cessna 172 known as a Skyhawk, it's only a 27 foot long airplane, uh, departed from Camp Grayling area and it had on board three Marine Corps reservists, they were from Illinois, that had been training in Grayling. And when they were in Grayling in 1978, they kept on hearing about Mackinac Island. You have to go up and check out Mackinac Island. And so they got into their private airplane at the end of their uh, training ops in Grayling, and they headed up to go to Mackinac Island. When they got to the Straits, the Straits were socked in like it very often is uh, when there's a, a big temperature difference between the air and the water surface. You get a lot of fog, uh, both in the spring and again in the fall. And as they were approaching Mackinac Island, they couldn't land there because of the fog. And so they kind of turned around and started heading back into a west and southwest direction. They did not see the bridge and the plane ended up flying into the North Tower of the Mackinac Bridge. And the three men on board were killed when the plane tumbled out of the suspension cables hit the roadway and then rolled off into the lake in a couple of hundred feet of water. And of course, airplane accidents still continue to happen in Lake Michigan. Dennis Collier was flying a Swan Lynn J, uh, a home built aircraft just this summer in July of 2021. He was off Beaver Island. The airplane ended up nose diving into a wave and flipped over. And fortunately, the pilot was able to extricate himself from the cockpit. He got out and sat on the tail of the aircraft until a Coast Guard vessel came and re rescued him from that plane crash. So in the course of a little less than 150 years or so, some 450 or so aircraft have gone down in Lake Michigan. And of course, it's not always just an entire aircraft that's going down. Sometimes it's just a big piece of an aircraft. Uh, Kalita Boeing 747 was flying out over Lake Michigan. It took off from Chicago in October 2004. And as it was about mid-lake over Chicago, one of the engines, and this is a gigantic engine, the size of, you know, like a Volkswagen bus, it ended up shearing from the wing, flipping up over the wing and crashing some 30,000 feet down into Lake Michigan. Eventually that airplane engine was located and recovered, but pieces and parts of it still remain on the lake bottom. And of course, aircraft are not really the only things that have crashed into the lakes either. In 1962, the Russians launched Sputnik 4, it was their fourth satellite to go up in space. This one had a cabin on board. It was an experimentation for manned space flight. Uh, Sputnik 4 was launched out of Kazakhstan in the Soviet Union. And it was expected to do a few orbits around the Earth and then re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, as it was, it ended up spending several years up in space. And in September 5th, 1962, it decided to finally lose orbit and come back to Earth. It did so uh, over what is now Manitowoc, Wisconsin. And as it was burning up, uh, and coming in back into the atmosphere, it ended up falling apart and large chunks of it, most of it ended up in Lake Michigan. A big hunk of it ended up in the street in downtown Manitowoc. And it has become a, a celebrity of sorts. Uh, that part of the spacecraft of Sputnik 4 was recovered. It was studied by the American government and ultimately returned to the Soviet Union. But 
where it impacted the street in downtown Manitowoc kind of developed an anniversary Sputnik festival. And every year people go to Manitowoc specifically to dress up like their favorite satellites and they have animal competitions to dress their dogs and cats and things like satellites. And that's just a great time in Manitowoc, one of those festivals that everyone must go to at one time in their lifetimes. Other things coming out of, from out of space ended up in Lake Michigan in 2017. A pretty large meteorite was seen uh, from Chicago area up to Manitowoc and Sheboygan, it just streaked across the lake. And there was, it was viewed by so many people, um, including scientists, they really wanted to make an effort to go out and find this. And so the uh, it wasn't only just visually viewed, but it was picked up on radar. So you got a pretty good uh, specific search area to look for fragments of this meteorite. So the Adler Planetarium out of Chicago created what is known as Project Aquarius, and they utilize our vessel here, the RV Storm that came from Thunder Bay, uh, operated by NOAA. And it went over and worked with partners in Chicago and Wisconsin to search for meteorite fragments by pulling a magnetized sled across the lake bottom and hoping that that would pick up fragments of this meteorite. It did pick up a lot of taconite and tin cans and other kinds of magnetic sorts of objects, uh, but no meteorite was found during that particular field season. So this is just really a selection of the nearly 450 aircraft of all variety that have entered the waters of Lake Michigan, uh, beginning in the 1870s and continuing right up through 2021. This is a wonderful collection of books if you're interested in this topic uh, to, to track these down and get more information. Uh, about any one of these, whether it's the early balloon ascensions or aviation accidents specifically on Lake Michigan. And if you have any more information, I'll be happy to entertain any questions. You can email me at lusardiw at michigan.gov. Thank you very much for your time today.